Great. All right, I think people are starting to join. Fabulous. Yep. All right, so thank you everyone for joining. My name is Jane Hauser. I am the Director of Marketing and Outreach for NASCA, and I am joined by Dr. Sophie Belenas. Um, thanks so much for registering for our webinar. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. Um, we have the chat feature turned on, and if you have any um, technical difficulties or questions along the way, you can let us know there. Um, if you have questions for Sophie, you can also add them to the Q&A um, feature, which has been enabled, which is down at the bottom of your screen. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Belenas. Thank you very much, Jean. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to delve into some of the ways that we can target OT goals and keep building on these skills now that we don't have the luxury of being in the building. Um, so as Jane mentioned, my name is Sophie Bolanis. I am an occupational therapist. I've worked at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels. I've worked on all different settings um, and I just really love school-based services. I think it's an excellent thing that we provide for a lot of our students. Um, I recently transitioned over to NESCA and here I'm doing some occupational therapy assessment, consultation, and working in our like, real life skills coaching program, which is a, a functional program, but today we're gonna stick to the school-based tasks. So let's get into it. Um, our objectives for today are reading and OT evaluation, understanding goal formation, um, then we're gonna really move into some specific strategies to target pieces of that OT evaluation. Um, and then finally, we'll go over some really specific activities to incorporate. Um, so I'm gonna start us off with just a quick uh, definition of school-based occupational therapy. This is from the American Occupational Therapy Association. And I think it helps to encapsulate how broad school-based OT can be. I know that a lot of people think of it as handwriting practice and while that's a very important aspect, um, it really is a little bit more comprehensive. So I'll just read this so we all start out on the same page. School-based occupational therapy practitioners support academic achievement and social participation by promoting occupation within all school routines, including recess, classroom, and cafeteria. They help children fulfill their role as students and prepare them for college, career, and community integration. So it really is across settings within the school building, it's across environments, and it's across activities. Um, so I just wanted to start there so we're all sort of at the same point. Um, I'm going to move on to reading the evaluation. The reason I think this is so important is that all of your child's occupational therapy goals are developed directly from this evaluation. And the further you move away from that sort of three-year reeval mark, the further you're moving along a natural progression. So it might not be as directly tied, but all of the underlying skills and all of the things that these kids need to work on are just right in that eval. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna just describe that a little bit. Um, so how to interpret an evaluation. My first suggestion is always to figure out the main reason that your child is considered eligible for services. This looks different across school districts. Um, I've worked in districts where there's a percentile cutoff and if a student has any score before the, below that percentile, they're gonna qualify for services. I have worked for schools where it's really up for, to the therapist's discretion and it's really based on clinical reasoning and clinical judgment. I've worked for school districts where only one score needs to be below. I've worked for school districts where all of the scores need to be below. So it really depends um, on where you are, why your child will be found eligible. But I find that that piece of information is really, really valuable because it gives you a place to start, like a main thing to focus on. Um, the next thing to look at in an evaluation are the descriptors that are used and the examples that are used. 
um, I find that this paints more of a picture than a number ever can. So you want to look for the example such as um, Charlie was unable to cut on a straight line across a piece of paper. That's functional. That tells you what's going on and like a specific skill that could be built. Um, the next recommendation, as with many fields, uh, OT is very full of jargon. There's lots of phrases that we use without meaning to um, or without understanding that they aren't part of the general terminology because we use them so often. Um, I find that use, when I personally read any other specialist's report, I'm like, oh, I need to double check what that word means. So I would just make sure to kind of either underline or highlight and make sure that you have a correct definition of all the words because I know that they're just full of words that are hard to define. I'm going to hopefully explain that a little bit further and make it easier to read by defining some of these words for you, but um, just making sure that some of this stuff isn't too clinical because often things are written that way. Um, and then my last recommendation for interpreting an evaluation is really hitting on these six areas and seeing, making sure that in terms of your child, you understand where they lie with fine motor, with visual perception, with visual motor integration, ocular motor skill, endurance, and sensory regulation. All of those things are likely highlighted. Um, and I recommend kind of getting a holistic view so that each of those pieces are explained and you, you feel that you have a strong understanding of them. Um, so most occupational therapy evaluations done in a school setting will have an observation piece. Um, I think this is a really valid piece because we can look at what the testing tells us and where the like specific skills are but putting that into practice is a huge step up. So reading this observation should relate directly to the testing. You should see an observation that touches on any fine motor struggles that you see, any visual issues that have popped up during the observation, that should all be noted. Um, I think that if there isn't an observation in your occupational therapy evaluation, it's absolutely appropriate to request one. Um, you know, just to say, I would really like to see an observation done by the OT in the classroom setting to see how this testing is affecting him or her in the real world. Um, there's so much information in an observation that I think that that's an important piece. And when you're reading it as a parent, I would say, does this look like your kid? Is this stuff that you would expect? Can you picture your student doing this in a classroom setting? Because if there's a mismatch there, um, I think it's important to think of other factors. Was it a weird day? Does it not make sense? If it does make sense, how is that going to affect all aspects of school? How's that going to affect recess? How's that going to affect lunch? How's that going to affect math and English? Just looking into these different things and considering the different environments that they're in throughout the day um, gives you a lot of information of how your student's doing kind of when they're not with you. So I, I I think an observation is a really important thing to focus on. Um, so now I'm going to go into just some of the common terms you're going to see in every OT evaluation. Every OT is checking on fine motor. Um, fine motor precision is the coordinated movements of the small muscles in the hand. So it's simply being able to move your hands, being able to pick things up, um, there are multiple grasp patterns that a lot of occupational therapists are going to touch on. There's your pincer grasp, which is being able to do this. There's a lateral grasp, which is like this. So you're using the side of your finger. There's the tripod or the three finger chuck, some call it, um, grasp. But those are all gonna be touched on, um, especially in the younger years, like before third or fourth grade. And that's really fine motor precision, being able to move the hands. Um, one thing that's not always mentioned because it is less of a common issue for our students is the coordinated release. So there are definitely some kids who can pinch, but they have a really hard time like letting go. So the release is another piece of that eval. 
Um, some common fine motor tasks are buttoning and zipping, turning a page in a book, you have to pinch and peel the next page up, and then just picking up really small items. I'm gonna move on to visual perception. So in an occupational therapy eval, visual perception does not assess how well your eyes see, how well they see, how well your eyes see. What visual perception is looking at is how well your brain interprets what your eye sees. I love this visual here because it really is that point of switching from the eyes to the brain and how does that work? How functional is that or how easy is that? Um, the ability to organize visual information, to interpret it and then really understand what it means um, is a huge skill and there's a lot that goes into it. So I'm going to get a little bit further into three specific visual perception skills that commonly come up on school-based testing and give a few examples of how that could affect a child in the classroom because I think that that's something that tends to be lacking um, is sort of that connection to functional output. So figure ground is the ability to identify relevant data from a busy or cluttered background. These are two examples of tasks that children who struggle with figure ground are going to have a really hard time with. Um, Word searches are really difficult. You're scanning, you're trying to see all the different words sort of pop out at you from a page full of letters. Um, this is similar to an I Spy book on the left. It has all of the little trinkets and tiny little things to search and try and find something. A teacher might say, where's the purple paper clip and expect the student to be able to find it within that jumble. Um, in a classroom, you see kids tend to struggle if they have issues with this skill on like those sheets that'll say do 100 math problems in a minute because um, it's so many things on the page. It's so much information um, and it's just really difficult to organize all of that to interpret it and give it meaning. Um, Another thing that tends to pop up in elementary classrooms is the really busy walls or the really busy posters and signs all around a whiteboard. Um, a student who struggles with figure ground may have a hard time finding what's being written on the board because their eyes are so distracted by all of the competing data. Um, visual closure is the ability to correctly perceive an object or word when part of it is hidden. Um, I think an example of this that I tend to tell is that for most literate adults, we can't look at a word without reading that word. Um, and a lot of that is because of our visual closure skills. We view something as a whole. When we're reading a novel, we're no longer sounding out each word. Our brain perceives that and looks at it as a whole and just knows what it says. It's very difficult to look at a sign and not read it. Um, so visual closure is being able to assume the rest of a picture. This matching pairs example that I have here, half of the butterfly is missing, but it's expecting students to be able to picture the whole and then match them appropriately. Um, this is really helpful with sight words because kids have to memorize just what it looks like. Um, they can't sound it out, they just need to know. So that's an example of how it shows up earlier on in an educational setting. Um, so the last big one I wanted to touch on is form constancy. This one's a little funky. It's the ability to recognize objects from various angles, viewpoints, or environments. So if you're looking at something and then the next day you see it flipped over and upside down, it's the ability to know that that's the same thing. It's the same object. Um, I see kids who struggle with form constancy really struggle with fonts. Um, that's why I put this example of all the different A's and B's and C's because we know that those are the same letters, but they look hugely different. They don't look like the same letter. They're, they're funky, they're creative, and they bring in really different styles despite, despite technically being the same shape. Um, Specifically, kids who have form constancy tend to struggle with fonts that have serifs, which are the little 
dashes at the end of each letter or like the top of the L and the bottom of the L. Um, those can throw kids off because kids don't quite understand visually that it's the same letter. It seems like it's adding in a lot of visual data. Um, and then in mathematics classes, learning how to, in your mind, visualize a flip or a slide or a translation, that can make it really difficult for kids who don't have that solid view of the form and, and aren't able to manipulate it in their mind. Um, so those are just three of the most common visual perception pieces that are assessed during a school-based OT eval within the realm of visual perception. Um, next up is everybody's favorite visual motor integration, which is really just the combination of the last two things I talked about. So it's taking your fine motor and it's taking your visual perception and it's using them in a coordinated, easy, smooth, combined manner, which sounds easy, but it's not. Um, so this is often referred to as hand-eye coordination. It's not exactly the same, but in, it, the way that you would think of hand-eye coordination is very similar to visual motor integration. Um, VMI can be affected by either a weakness in visual perception or a weakness in fine motor, or it can be affected just simply with a weakness specifically in integrating the two. So if your child stu struggles with visual motor integration, I suggest trying to kind of build an understanding of what the root cause is. Does your kid have fine motor issues, visual motor issues, or is the integration truly where the struggles lie? Is it that combination piece? Um, this is really big for school-based tasks. Um, you know, this student here is doing a puzzle, that's looking, that's manipulating to get things lined up, and then that's being able to put together small pieces. Um, handwriting is really the big one where this pops up, being able to look at a letter and recreate that letter. Really difficult. It's not an easy skill to master. It's quite scaffolded throughout the school day, but a lot of students need extra support with this. Um, going to move right on to ocular motor function. I'm just going to touch on this. Um, some OTs assess it, some don't. I'm a big fan of just assessing it and making sure it's touched on. It's just the six eye muscles moving together in a coordinated fashion. So, you know, it's assessed by somebody, can you follow the stimulus? Can you look up, down, out to the sides? Um, just, I just wanted to touch on it because you might see it. Um, strength and endurance. All of your strength and endurance is going to affect your fine motor output. Having a strong core, a strong foundation is gonna give you more control when using the muscles at the end of your appendages if you're feeling stable. Um, this is often touched on in an evaluation. I, I have to say when assessing like fourth grade through eighth grade boys specifically, it's always really low. <laughs> I don't want people to freak out. Um, or just feel overwhelmed by reading that um, because they're just growing through such a growth phase that I feel that every evaluation I've ever written of a student that age does touch on decreased endurance, but that's developmentally appropriate. Um, so this is just an important thing to take into consideration. Um, and then finally we have sensory. Sensory is assessed and touched on and supported in a school environment. Specific sensory integration is rarely worked on a school on in a school environment. That's more of a clinic setting, but this sensory piece is a huge aspect of a student's day. So it is definitely thought about and worked on. Um, so it's generally a screen. It's generally just a questionnaire or something like that to get a picture of a student sensory functioning in the school environment. Um, and then an OT will come in and put things like a sensory diet into place, some fidgets, adaptive seating. Um, schedule and movement breaks appropriately. Um, and then sometimes, like we talked about the visual perception, build in visual modifications. Um, a really common one you might see are the three, the trifold things that go in front of a student's desk. I've used that a lot for students who have struggles with specifically figure ground or visual perception because it just eliminates visual data and they're looking at their paper to study. So that's an important piece. Um, Last, I'm sorry, 
My scroll's not working. Last but not least, I'm gonna move on to self-regulation. This is the ability to get one's body into an optimal state of arousal, level of arousal. So they're being able to kind of calm themselves, get their body ready for learning. Um, this is normally incorporated into a whole class system and most schools have a curriculum or specific strategies that they use kind of across the board. Um, but there are students that need extra instruction and really a targeted approach to be able to do this independently. Um, so all that should be touched on in an evaluation and in order to work on skill building, really understanding that eval is the best way to start. All right, so moving on to goals. Goals, how are goals formulated? I find that there's often, there often seems to be a disconnect between the evaluation and the goals that are written, but the reality is that there shouldn't be. And it may be hidden and it may not be well explained, but there really should be a direct correlation. Um, so OT is taken into consideration the demands of the environment, their observation of the student, and then the specific skills, how those relate to academics and school function. But if you're reading an evaluation that says, Charlie has difficulty with visual perception, visual mo memory, and fine motor, it may be really confusing when you get a goal that says what's written here with no more than one visual prompt. Charlie will copy three sentences from the whiteboard at least three feet away with 100% accuracy. It doesn't seem like they connect, but everything in that goal is working on building those skills. So in terms of goal formulation, if it isn't clear to you, I really suggest asking specifically, how is that targeting it. So what I've put together is a list of questions to ask around goals to your child's occupational therapist, just to make sure that the whole picture is clear. Um, so what specific guilt skills are being targeted in order to increase my child's ability to meet this goal? If a goal is handwriting, they will are likely targeting visual motor integration, but you might want to go a step further. You might want to know, are they targeting that because of a fine motor deficit? or a visual perception deficit, really understanding the reasoning behind it. Um, what can I do to target this skill without simply repeating and practicing the activity? While an OT's goals are always focused directly on academics, the intervention is not necessarily always focused on academics. If we have a student who needs to build up handwriting, we might be playing board games that work on hand strength and developing grasp patterns. So you might wanna ask for some su suggestions that target the direct skill, but aren't just doing the goal over and over again until you can do it because children get bored. Um, next one, if my child meets this goal, what's a natural progression? We don't know how long we'll be home, um, but at least for Massachusetts, it's gonna be through the end of the year. There's a good chance that some OT goals are supposed to be met by March or April or May of this year and hopefully or likely or maybe not, it depends on the kid, but some of those goals have been met. So where, where do we go next? Um, you know, some schools are having IEP meetings, which is awesome, and are providing updated goals through a remote model. Um, but how can you move forward if you haven't received that information? What is a typical goal that comes after this skill that my student has managed to master? Um, and then finally, this is less for the current remote learning paradigm and at home, but I just like to put this in there so people have the information. I think it's important to ask, why is this goal being targeted in a push in or pull out approach? That's the B grid versus C grid on the IEP. Um, so is it happening in the classroom with the other students as sort of an integrated model, or are they being brought out to the occupational therapy room or somewhere outside of the classroom to work on this skill? Um, there are hundreds of reasons to do both, but I just think it's an important thing to understand um, why your OT has chosen to do it that way. I think it's definitely worth kind of checking in on and making sure you're aware of because that does change throughout the progression of elementary school and it's, it's nice to understand why. Um, so I'm gonna move on to sort of the bulk of our discussion here today onto the skill building piece so what can we do to target these common OT areas? What are things that can help our kids build on these skills if they're not meeting, you know, 
three times 30 a week with their OT in the school setting. So I will start with fine motor. This first recommendation is for our students who are really starting to learn how to write, starting to learn how to hold a pencil correctly on paper. Um, and that is to practice writing on a vertical surface or so like if this is vertical, either this surface or something like this, just tilt it up. A common intervention we use is like a two inch binder, just resting it on that um, to help our kids get their hands in the correct position. Um, practicing with buttons and zippers is great. These are fine motor tasks that our kids have to master eventually. So getting started is great. Just, you know, having them button a shirt all the way up and unbutton it again. Um, Drawing, coloring, and painting, all anything with a pencil is gonna build that skill. And then activities that require your child to pinch. And I recommend the pincer grasp, the two finger grasp, and then the lateral grasp. So they're practicing all of these hand movements. Um, there are a lot of fun things that make kids do that. This picture right here of the child with the kind of tongs is my absolute favorite. Um, you want to think of where your child's level is. So if they're younger, maybe using like big salad tongs to pick things up. Um, in my OT office, I always have salad tongs, really small tongs, plastic tweezers, tiny tweezers, anything that they have to pinch and control separately is great. Um, it's a lot of pinpointing where you're going to squeeze, squeezing with the appropriate pressure, moving something over and releasing with the appropriate pressure. Um, it's a great skill building activity. So just incorporating that into either picking up little things um, is a great way. Peeling stickers doesn't seem like a huge activity, but it is really great because kids have to find the corner, they have to pinch, and they have to peel. Um, I always suggest if your child can't get the corner, instead of peeling the sticker off for them, just peel up the corner and hand it back. Make sure that they're doing some piece of this activity at all times. Um, and then playing with clay, stringing beads is a great one that works on bilateral. So that's bringing in both hands to do an activity. So they're working together. Anything with small, little activities or toys um, or manipulatives to help them practicing things with their hands. Um, visual perception. I, all, I really like the game I Spy. I think we've all played that as children that I spy with my little eye. I don't know if our parents all knew they were working on visual perception, but I like to think they did. Um, but you can play that outside. Um, one thing I play with classes, if I'm doing sort of a all class intervention is, can we find 10 things that are orange? Can you find 10 things that are red? And if you're sitting around and looking, they are tracking, they're searching, they're trying to find um, if colors are too easy, you can move right along to can you find 10 things that are round? Um, and you know, just can you find 10 things that look like they might feel bumpy? Just bringing in sort of that visual thinking, helping kids to notice things. Um, I have sort anything and everything because I'm a huge fan of sorting activities. Um, that could be taking out all your silverware and dumping it on a table and having your children match all the little forks and all the big forks and all the knives and all the spoons. That could be bringing in a box of nuts and bolts and screws and having them sort by all those. Um, it could be mixing up two different boxes of pasta and having them pick out the penne and the rigatoni. Um, so sorting is great. It helps kids to recognize things based on different characteristics. So sorting by color, sorting by feeling, sorting by size, all of those help our kids visually distinguish data and information. Um, the image I have here works specifically on visual closure because you're trying to find the whole. It also works on figure ground because it's picking data out of a really cluttered background. Um, I think if you search online, there's some great things like this, just printouts. But other than that, you can do puzzles, you can do word searches, hidden pictures, spot the difference. The Where's Waldo books are fabulous for figure ground. Again, I don't know if that was the intention, but I like to think so. Um, 
I'm going to move on to visual motor integration. So the, this is generally targeted with handwriting in schools. I put this image up here because it gives a bit of a developmental picture about where kids likely should be. It's very exact. It has like very exact years and months. I tend to be a much more of a generalist in terms of eh, around four, around four and a half. Um, but this is the progression that most kids are able to draw in. So the top row and then the bottom row. We always start with working on horizontal lines. So if you're working on an, with an almost three-year-old, just try and get them to kind of do these horizontal lines then, or vertical lines. Then move on to horizontal lines. Um, I like this image because it just kind of gives a pretty good picture. Um, another one for visual motor integration is just you draw a picture with maybe eight lines in it and have your child try and copy the exact same picture. Um, mazes are great because they have to see where they're going and then they have to stay within a boundary, which helps work on that kind of control piece. Um, again, cut anything and everything. I think that there's so many things around here that we don't mind shredding, like a newspaper or pamphlets that came in the mail, just kind of junk mail. Letting kids just cut, cut, cut is great practice. If they're not old enough to cut, let them rip. You know, let them rip apart the newspaper. They're practicing pinching, that's a lateral pinch. They're practicing pulling in different directions with two hands. They're building up their strength. They're building up their bilateral coordination. Anything that's fun that they're interested in doing that uses both hands and uses them in a coordinated manner, I'm a huge fan of. Um, then practicing throwing and catching. That's a piece of visual motor integration. That's more the hand-eye coordination piece. And it's just great for tracking a ball that's coming close. It's a really tough skill for some kids. Some kids pick it up like that and they can do it by two years old and other kids like myself start to be able to do that around six. <laughs> um, but just practice is good for anyone. Um, and then last but not least is practice crossing midline. So midline is this invisible line that goes right down the center of your body. And crossing midline would be bringing, for me right now, my right hand across to the left side of my body. And if I was using tweezers to pick something up over here and bring it back across midline, that's crossing midline. And it's really good for helping our kids integrate the two sides of their bodies. So maybe I'll put a little cup with pasta in it. I have tongs and I have my kid reach across their body and put them into another cup. They're practicing their grasp, but they're practicing crossing midline. And that's really building skill and practicing skill at the same time. So next up we have sensory and self-regulation. So I want to start with a little caveat here. Most schools have a system that they're already using. Most schools have either something that they have pictures of on the walls, they have, maybe they're using the zones of regulation curriculum, maybe they're using the alert curriculum. There's different ways to target this skill, but they're often school-wide interventions. Um, so, I would recommend before trying to target this at home, check in with school and make sure you know that you're using the same system they are. Um, like, are you feeling like you're in the green zone is something that's part of the zones of regulation curriculum. That means that your body feels regulated, you feel ready for learning, you're in the green means go zone. Um, and I think using that terminology across settings, so if that's what they were learning at school, it's great to try and bring that into the home so that you are consistent and that they feel like they're using a strategy that they can use in different places. Um, so before you try to start working on this at home, I would always recommend checking in with the school system and making sure you're being consistent. Um, another option that I'm a huge fan of is a sensory retreat. Um, a colleague of mine at NESCA did a beautiful blog about this, talking about the need for our students to feel like they have somewhere to just feel. and somewhere that they can kind of escape from this kind of current world we're living in where everyone is cooped up in the same house, everyone does everything in all different rooms. Um, I think a designated place to escape and feel 
like they have their own space is huge. That being said, um, a lot of our kids are going to need instruction in how to use that space. Um, if there are no screens allowed or if it's just, you know, a corner that's set up for them to feel separate, I think they might need some activities to bring with them. So here is a book you can read. Here are some colored pencils you can use. Um, you know, here's a special squishy ball you can squeeze if you're trying kind of trying to get your worries out. Um, but I think that self-regulation can definitely be worked on if they have their own space. Um, I think helping kids learn how to self-monitor is huge. If your child is sort of off the walls, just saying, wow, your body feels or seems really worked up right now. Your body is moving really fast. I'm noticing that. Um, and just pointing it out helps them see it. Like, oh my gosh, I am moving really fast. Um, and then modeling things you do yourself to make that better. So if I was in a room with a three-year-old and I was feeling overwhelmed, I could say, oh gosh, I'm feeling really overwhelmed and like I'm moving too fast right now. I might go outside and take a 10 minute walk. Would you like to come with me? Just modeling that strategy of learning to self-regulate um, really helps our kids kind of feel it and learn that they can do that too. Um, I'm going to touch on multisensory learning just because it's one of the huge theories that is touched on in OT because it does incorporate all of the senses. So it's this theory that individuals learn better if they're taught using more than one sense. It's really commonly used in kindergarten classrooms. Um, so the senses that are generally targeted are visual, auditory, tactile, kind of that kinesthetic learning. Um, so examples would be water play, pouring things to measure. Um, a place you'll see it again in those kindergarten classrooms a lot is a tray of rice or a tray of beans. And what a child is expected to do is take their finger and like write a capital letter A and then take their pencil and write the capital letter A. Um, that tactile feedback from the rice and learning that movement pattern before trying to incorporate the fine motor precision um, is a great strategy for helping kids to build skills. Our kids love bringing in all sorts of things. They love sand, they love water, they love putty, they love clay, they love touching and paint and getting messy a lot of the time. Um, so trying to bring that in. A more appropriate sort of older child example would be a book on tape. They're getting, if they're following along with it, so they're getting that auditory input and then they're incorporating the visual as they go. Um, so bringing in multiple senses can really help bolster that learning. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on is the role of play in games. I know I talked a little bit earlier about when we're targeting goals, we don't always just practice that goal over and over again because kids need variety and kids need things to be new. So there are lots of board games, some that are intentionally, but a lot that are intentionally targeting these skills in kids. Um, so I put up a couple examples of some really good visual perception ones and some really good fine motor ones. Um, unsurprisingly, all of these games work on visual motor and fine motor. I would just say that the examples as they're listed are a little bit heavier on that skill. But if we look at something like Connect Four, um, the visual perception piece is being able to scan, being able to find the horizontal and the vertical and the diagonal lines of all red or lines of all black. Um, but there is the fine motor piece of having to, you know, pinch and pick up the checker and then fit it into the slot. So there's all sorts of things. Um, games like that, I have kids set them up themselves. I don't know last time you guys set up Connect Four, but trying to get everything sorted together and pushed together might be frustrating for a little bit, but it's building skills. It's trying to manipulate different things and put them together and make it work. And then the outcome is getting to play a fun game. So there's sort of a natural built-in intrinsic motivation piece there. Um, I will say my favorite game on this whole page is Spot It. 
I don't know if you've played it. It's a really cool game. There are circles and they have all different pictures on them. And each child gets a circle with pictures. And if you see something that matches, you hit it and you say the name of it. It's a really quick game. There's all different varieties, um, but it's a very cool matching, high speed visual perception game. So I would recommend looking at that one specifically. Um, so as there is a role of playing games, there is also the role of the outdoors. Um, I myself am a huge nature lover and I believe that mother nature is our best teacher and that the, the outdoors environment is the best environment for a lot of our kids to work on building some of these skills. So I have 10 examples here. I'm going to quickly touch on each of them and just sort of describe how they can affect all of these skills. I have get dirty. That's, you know, let kids play in the mud, let them dig. Digging builds hand strength. Building things builds all your pinching and all of the coordination of the bilateral control. Um, if you want to take it a step further, planting a garden, they're picking up tiny seeds, they're digging little holes with one finger to put the seeds in, they're burying things up, and then there's, again, there's a huge intrinsic motivation there as they're watching a plant grow, they're watching something sprout um, over the course of the week or week and a half or whatever comes after. Climbing trees feels very simple, but that whole postural endurance piece, working on core strength, working on strong hands, all of that is built in. Um, a nature scavenger hunt is very visual perception heavy. Um, I am going to link a blog that I wrote here that goes really in depth for all of these and kind of gives some suggestions on how to do it. Um, but that's a great visual perception activity, so you can, you can find that up here. Um, building forts, making fossils, um, that's just, you know, finding things outside and printing them into clay, making a bird feeder, painting rocks and shells, drawing with sidewalk chalk is a great activity. Um, I personally recommend the thin sidewalk chalk. I'm not a huge fan of the really thick sidewalk chalk, just because it really changes how you hold it. And for kids with tiny hands, we want to give them an object that makes sense for their tiny hands. Um, again, not the end of the world. If you have the big sidewalk chalk, it's all practice, but if you're at the store, I would pick the smaller one. Um, and then the last but not least is bringing out the bubbles. This works on a lot. I like to incorporate games, so trying to clap the bubbles, trying to poke the bubbles with a stick, all sorts of different things that build, bring in lots of different skills, lots of different patterns that they're practicing. Um, so before I get to questions, I was going to just scroll, oops, sorry, scroll to the end here and point out, oh goodness, a few of the resources that I've provided. Um, this first one here is the American Occupational Therapy Association, Association information on school-based practice. There's a lot there. Um, it may feel like some of it is just for clinicians, but there's a lot of information about you know, even backpacks that are best for kids, how things should be targeted at school, how things are targeted state by state. So if you wanted to check in there, there's some great information. Um, and then I just attached a few specific school focused blogs that talk about fine motor or bringing in the outdoors and just kind of school-based therapy at home. So I will go back up to questions. I'm wondering if Anybody has any specific questions? I know I was a little bit elementary focused, um, so I'm happy to touch on anything other than that or anything that people would like to learn about. So Sophie, there is one question here about um, which OT sensory fine motor strategies that you would see would work for a teenager, say 17, with ASD, um, HF, dysgraphia, that have a very poor handwriting besides keyboarding, mm -hmm. um, poor executive skills, low arousal, stimulation, seeker, um, then becomes overstimulated and stressed out and wants to stop doing everything um, kind of on a regular basis or, an, or on a longer term basis. Okay, great. I'm just looking at this question here too. So, 
Yes, a lot of OTs are going to immediately jump to keyboarding just because this takes out some of the really high level visual motor that's necessary, but that doesn't work for everyone. So if we're talking about OT sensory and fine motor strategies, the first thing I would say is making sure the environment is appropriate. Um, for a student like this, I would always start off with having him write on a slant board. Um, that really promotes the correct grasp. And then I think there's also another piece of making sure that the ex expectation is reasonable. So if this student is being expected to write two paragraphs, that would probably be difficult. And at that point, it might make sense to write, bring in a keyboard. That's not always reasonable. And I would start focusing on things like maybe filling out a job application, things where they're writing one word at a time, um, and making sure we're giving an appropriate demand while also making things reasonable. Um, but yes, the first thing I would say is trialing a couple different writing tools, which you would have to do with an occupational therapist. So I can't really say what the best writing tool would be, but I would ask for an assessment of that. Um, and then I would always have them writing on a slant board. That'll really make that hand position much easier. Um, even just a binder, like I said. So the binder with the, you know, the two inch side here, so it's slanting down towards a student. So they're writing kind of at this angle, really promotes correct hand position. Um, for some of these kids, I'll have them write on their belly if they're up for it, if they're interested, just in their own bedroom or um, lying on their stomach with a slant board can be, it requires endurance and postural strength, but it can be helpful. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes, yeah, so um, another one here we have is, we had been doing a bunch of worksheets, worksheets in April since school's closed. Now our teacher is using Seesaw and almost all of my son's schoolwork is online with an iPad. How much would you expect skills will regress or how worried should I be not having worksheets for writing, cutting, coloring in the next six weeks? It's a really good question. So I would say that there will likely be some regression um, and I would try and build it in in different ways, build in that fine motor practice and that visual motor practice in different ways. If this student is already doing a substantial amount of schoolwork stuff on an iPad, worksheets doesn't make sense. They're getting that schoolwork fix. Um, and, and they shouldn't be expected to do extra, but that's where I'd start looking into some of these really fun strategies. That's where I would start looking into, you know, making beaded necklaces, things that are working on the same foundational skills and the foundational principles, but aren't academic based. So that's when you're looking at board games or things to do outside to work on the same skill. If you're still doing skill building, I would anticipate kind of significantly less regression, but there's going to be some. And, and the way I see it, that's just kind of the name of the game with this. Your OTs are going to get your kids caught up. Teachers are going to get kids caught up. You know, we can't do everything. Um, but I would, I would anticipate some regression. And that's where I'd bring in the, you know, have them cut up the newspaper. Have them find a magazine and cut out all the pictures that they like. You know, I, I think that it's okay if those skills on are worked on in less of an academic setting. Um, but I think some regression is to be anticipated. Okay, and we have another one here. Our school district is telling us that occupational therapy is not something that can be done via teletherapy because the OT has to be able to touch the student. Is this true that OTs can't provide any services via telehealth? So I don't wanna speak in huge sweeping statements. I know that some OTs are providing telehealth services, but this is very, very student dependent. Um, from my own experience, I have worked with students who I think I could do telehealth therapy services appropriately. And I've worked with some students who I don't think it would be beneficial for them. Um, so while I would say that it's not something that can never happen, it's very individualized. Um, often an OT does have to touch a student and I'm of the belief that it would be really difficult to do OT assessment through teletherapy. Um, but some of those interventions I would say can be worked on with some students, but not all. Uh, 
And we have another one here. Do you feel handwriting goals remain appropriate for a student who is 12 years old, or do you focus on functional skills and executive functioning? Oh, this is one of my favorite questions, Jane. Um, so I am a big believer that around 11 or 12, if handwriting is incredibly difficult, stressful, tiring for a child, that switching to keyboarding, functional skills, and some executive functioning is a good idea. That being said, I also believe that the need for handwriting does not disappear. It doesn't go anywhere. We have to be able to do that. A lot of students have to be able to do that. Um, and so what I would switch the handwriting goal to around that age is often a functional handwriting goal. So can your student type the paragraph they need to or exhibit these executive functioning skills, but I like to keep a goal that is, can this student fill out a job application within the appropriate margins? Because that stuff is necessary. Um, you're gonna have to be able to write out a check, sign a check, um, write out a grocery list, fill out a job application. So I'm not saying that this student is necessarily gonna benefit from practicing writing five paragraph essays, but there are functional life-based tasks that they're gonna to need to be able to do. And I always suggest that if handwriting goals just aren't, don't feel appropriate, thinking of that functional handwriting piece. How can I change this goal so I'm working on a skill that my child will really use? Because the reality is we live in a digital world and a lot of this can be accommodated for digitally, but not everything can. Um, so I would kind of amend the goal, not take it away. Um, that's how I approach that at a middle school level. Oh, Jane, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, can you also address what types of materials should parents be getting from their child's school OT? Are there specific plans? Are there, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about the sensory diet, how that can be worked into the home environment. Great. So I think that the reality is what OTs are going to be able to send home is likely worksheets, worksheets and things like that, um, or descriptions of activities that can be worked on with commonly found household activities like tweezers, like, you know, Q-tips. Um, so it really does depend on your home setting and your school setting, what you're going to get in terms of fine motor and visual perception and things like that. If your student is a sensory kid, who has a sensory diet in the school setting, many of those principles can be implemented in home. Um, a sensory diet that I may put together might have that before heading back to the classroom from lunch, this student will bring a box of books down to the office. Often that box of books doesn't need to go to the office, but the student needs that kind of heavy lifting break before they reintegrate into, right into the classroom. Um, OTs know what is being delivered at school, and I think it's fully appropriate to ask that OT to explain that diet and help you brainstorm how you can implement it at home. Help you brainstorm some calming activities, some you know arousing activities to get kids waking up a little bit, um, and how to build those into the sort of remote learning day that you're trying to put together. Um, but yeah, I think worksheets are gonna be pretty common. There are a lot of great apps um, that can be recommended by your school OT, like specific ones that are correct for your child to be practicing with. Um, but a lot of OT is done with materials and tools and you know, OTs can't be sending that home to every kid, but we can get creative with what is in our homes, absolutely. Great, any other questions? I don't see any others coming in. All right. Well, thank you everyone for, um, for your time. And we appreciate your registering and logging in and um, we are available for questions. And Sophie, if you'd like to just run through a couple of the um, 
the services that Nesca is offering at this stage remotely. That would be great. Absolutely. So one of the things we have here is the um, sort of in response to the, the coronavirus is help coping and help processing. So we have some psychotherapy available for individuals with pre-existing mental health conditions. So and people who are newly struggling with this anxiety worry. I know all of these things are on the rise. Depression and loneliness is really setting in as people feel isolated. So um, we are available, our psychologists are available to talk about that. Um, additionally, we have our real life skills coaching program, which I spoke a little bit about at the beginning. Um, we offer consultation, um, we will offer executive function skill building directly with the student or in consultation to parents. Um, you know, this is a interesting new remote learning world and it comes with a lot of skill requirements that are tough. So um, I personally do a lot of executive functioning coaching for adolescents, building sort of that ability to organize and initiate and build up self-sufficient strategies to do all this stuff alone. So that's available um, as a resource for our students as well. So my email is at the very beginning. There's a link here for the intake form if you're interested in either of those services. And I would be happy to hear from anybody with specific questions and love to set up a consult if someone has a child that they need some help keeping busy or keeping targeted. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating, and we'll be um, uh, posting new webinars soon, and hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was great to speak with you all.